Don't hope not to talk as long as Khrushchev, though. <laughs> Welcome to the League of Women Voters annual meeting, our first annual meeting. It's really not going to be anything like any annual meeting in the future will be, because tonight we really don't have any business. We just have a program. We're, we're really lucky tonight. You should see the, the uh, bulletins I get from other leagues all over the state. This thick, and it's the minutes and the proceedings of their annual meeting, and they last from 9 until 3.30, and they're long, long meetings, and they plan the program for the next year and vote on what items they're going to study, and they're very long and complicated meetings, and a good deal of preparation has been made for the meetings. Well, tonight we lucked out, and none of us have prepared except for our program. So <laughs> tonight we've had a holiday, so we're, we're very lucky. I must, I think before I begin the meeting, I'll explain why these cameras are uh, focused on us and why the lights are bright and all. WOI uh, TV station at Ames, Iowa, the State University of Iowa station, uh, is filming and um, uh, taping this tonight to use uh, for Betty Lou McVeigh's program. Have you ever listened to WOI? Perhaps you're familiar with Betty Lou McVeigh's program. She uh, wants to do a program on the League of Women Voters because 1970 is their 50th anniversary year, and we're all ready, as you perhaps have noticed in your Iowa voter. That, did you all get your little Iowa voter, incidentally? Well, you probably saw news of the 50th anniversary in that. And you just introduced the board, for those of you who do not know some of the board members. Our new legislative chairman, she is the second vice president of the Iowa League of Women Voters, and she also heads a very important part of our league, a uh, committee of lobbyists, which, of course, lobby in the legislature. And uh, Marge will be presenting a review and an updating of our state program. Uh, she will be saving us an awful lot of time in unit meetings, and, and we are really, as I said before, quite... I hope you feel that way when I'm all through, because this is pretty lengthy. I'm going to warn you right now. I'm just terribly pleased to be here. I want to congratulate Today we're visiting the greenhouse here on the Iowa State University campus, and just in case some of you might be fortunate enough to receive as a gift one of the flowers that we're going to talk about, we thought you'd be interested in knowing how to take care of it. So we have Ben Vance, Extension Horticulturist at Iowa State. Ben, I guess when we start talking about Christmas flowers, uh, poinsettia, I guess, leads the list, doesn't it? Yes, by far, I think, Dale. It's uh, been a popular Christmas plant for a good many years and still remains the most popular one. We have others that are in, in the picture, of course, but nothing that comes up to the uh, sales and use of the poinsettia. Mm -hmm. It's a very beautiful plant. Why don't you tell us about this beautiful poinsettia we have here? All right, Dale, this, of course, is 
a poinsettia that we have, like we've used for many years. Now, well, we must realize that this one here, in case you don't have color, is red, and then there's a pink one, and then, then there's also a white one. They, we call it white, but actually it's a very pale, creamy yellow. Uh, the poinsettia is a plant that is relatively easy to take care of in the home if you just remember three or four points, and th these I will try to give you. First, uh, a poinsettia cannot stand chilling. That is, if, if you chill it to any great extent uh, <laughs> by opening the door or the window, something like this, and, and the temperature suddenly drops, that poinsettia is going to suffer. On the other hand, it doesn't like extremely high temperatures, uh, as some people have in their living room mm -hmm. or dining room. A temperature of 65 to 75 degrees is about right, and I think that would catch most people's homes. And as I say, don't uh, put them in full, or don't give them cause them to have a draft around them, and don't put them in full sun when you get them home. Get them home. Now give them lots of light. Uh, a nice window where you get plenty of reflected light, but no direct sunlight. And the fourth point is that they are very sensitive to overwatering or to drying of the soil. So they should have plenty of water, um, but the soil should not be saturated at all times. Just give them enough water to keep the soil slightly moist. And if you will follow those four <coughs> points, of uh, preventing chilling of the plant, a temperature of 60 to uh, 65 to 75 degrees, and the watering of the plant, and keep it out of direct sunlight. You should have no trouble in carrying a plant through for, well, Dale, I've seen them, uh, uh, many homes here in the Ames area where they have them in bloom up into April. Is that Still right? in pretty good shape hmm. because they had the right conditions. I think, Ben, you might comment on the bloom of the poinsettia. I think it's rather interesting. It is very interesting, Dale. The thing that we see here that we call the bloom or the flower is actually not the flower itself. This, these nice red, brilliant red leaves are actually, um, are rather what we call petals or leaves, are actually the leaves of a, the plant uh, they're modified, they have a different color than the natural green. Uh, right in this area here, Dale, is where we find the flowers. Those little portions right there, you mm -hmm. see, those are the flowers. And uh, this is the true flower of the poinsettia right in here, while these are actually modified leaves, the, the attractive part. Ben, you say that it isn't too difficult to keep a poinsettia. We often get the question whether they can be carried over. Yes, they can, Dale. It's a great deal of trouble for most people. <laughs> Some people do this. I would say a very small percentage of the people that get poinsettias or buy poinsettias uh, use them, uh, that is, keep them over from one year to the next. A few people do, and they seem to have uh, success with it, but they're tricky and they're difficult to do. Mm -hmm. You've got to have the right conditions, and some people have this in their home and others do not. Now, we do have a pamphlet, Dale, that will tell more about the care of poinsettia, <coughs> as well as the uh, carrying them through the, the entire season if you wanted to, from one year to the next. And if you'd like to have a copy of this pamphlet, just ask for the Christmas poinsettia. You can get a copy at your county extension office or writing to the station, and uh, we'll see that you get it. And good luck with your <coughs> poinsettia if you're fortunate enough to get one. Well, Ben, of course, you mentioned poinsettia isn't the only Christmas plant that is uh, very popular. This, this one here, Dale, is coming into the picture as a popular uh, Christmas plant, and they're very beautiful. I think the cyclamen, which this is, is one of our very fine pot plants. Now, the, the, the shape of the, of the blossom is so attractive to me. It, it reminds me of a, of a bird in flight, mm -hmm. and uh, I've heard other people say the same. This one here is a, a dark, uh, deep pink. They come in various colors, red, uh, white and pinks, and they are, I think, one of our nice plants. Now, the cyclamen should have relatively cool temperatures. That is, if you can put them in a room in the evening, or if you can keep them in a room when you get them home, where the temperature is down uh, in the 50s even, uh, they will keep much longer there than they do if you put, a, put them out into a warm living room or a dining room. Uh, so keep them as cool as you can, down to a point, of course and you will have new buds developing from these down in the port in the center of the plant here. Oh, I and you'll see. have a good, uh, nice bloom from them. Well, now, would you say this is as sensitive as a poinsettia or less sensitive? Well, I think probably if you keep, give it cool, it's uh, pretty much, keep it cool, it's pretty much the same. Same. Mm -hmm. Yes. Now, the thing about uh, the psych or the cyclamen is the attractive leaves. They are 
very pretty leaves, even when the plant is not in bloom, they're pretty. Now this is another plant that is difficult to carry through from one season to the next. Some people do, but uh, it's not, I, I wouldn't advise it unless yeah. you've got just good conditions. Another popular one. This is a very popular plant, the azalea, for Christmas giving and for Christmas decorations. Uh, they are just, they just literally load themselves with blooms. And as I said about the cyclamen, they come in various colors, white, pink, orange, and so on. So the, the uh, azalea is another good Christmas plant. Uh, remember that azalea likes it, azalea, the azalea likes it cool also. Uh, like the cyclamen, if you can put these in a place where the temperature is down in the, uh, keep them in a place where the, at night where the temperature is down in the um, old middle 50s, that would be fine for the azalea. And again, keep the soil slightly moist. Don't overwater and don't let it dry out. Now this applies to all three of these plants, the azalea, the cyclamen, and the poinsettia. If they're allowed to dry out, they, especially the poinsettia, it can just drop its leaves almost immediately. Or if they're overwatered, this is another serious thing too, Dale. Then Ben, uh, you said there's another plant we have here uh, that they're starting to push as a Christmas plant. Now, what do you say that was? This is a Kalanchoe, uh, Dale. It's I don't know of any common name for it, other than that, and it is um, a good, uh, serviceable plant. It's one that can take a lot of abuse, and this one here is a brilliant. Uh, well, it's kind of a brick color, I guess, isn't it? Uh, light mm -hmm. red? Yeah, light red. And it is a, it is a good uh, Christmas plant, and it's being used more and more all the time because uh, it, it is less temperamental than these other three that I mentioned. And if you can't get along with the three that I've mentioned earlier, this one here is, is for you because it's, it's one that can take quite a bit of abuse. You mean you're making it no, personal? No, for, not, not for you, oh. Dale, no. Well, you're no, probably for... right, but I didn't want you to be quite so blunt about it. <laughs> I was it, very blunt, wasn't I? <laughs> now, what did you but say that was again? Kalanchoe, and this is one that is being, as I say, used more and more. It uh, is a tough plant, relatively tough. Again, if, it, if you can keep it fairly cool, well, that helps it. So actually, these four are all very typical Christmas plants. I notice you also have some beautiful mums yes, down here. Yes, chrysanthemums uh, are, are a popter. Uh, African uh, violets are more popular than, uh, than they have been for years, Dale, for Christmas giving. And African violet fans exchange plants, you know, yeah. exchange nice potted plants in bloom. Are they, uh, get them from a florist and so on. And they are very nice. Do you want to look at these? Well, now, of course, the mums, uh, often you see, you know, in football season, but I didn't realize they're quite as popular now. Yes, they're popular the year round, chrysan chrysanthemums are, Dale. Uh, the florist used to grow mums just in the fall, yeah. like we do outside because of the short days. But now then with black cloth, and this, this uh, right here is the, are the frames for oh, the I black see. cloth, you see, uh -huh. so that we can regulate the shade, uh, we can shorten the day, or if we want to, we can lengthen the day by artificial lighting at night, and we can have uh, mums in bloom any time of the year. Okay, thanks a lot, uh, Ben, and I hope that you will receive a, one of these beautiful plants for Christmas, and hope that you've also uh, received a few pointers on how to take care of them. Ben Vance, Extension Horticulturist here at Iowa State.
Hannah Gifton participated in the Institute of World Affairs at Iowa State, which was held recently. And I want to clarify at this time, we are talking to him while he is here during the Institute of World Affairs, so that if anything that is said has been outdated by the time we are actually on the air, then I think uh, people will have to take that into consideration. He is part of the uh, permanent mission of Israel to the United Nations, and perhaps you should say what's your position with... Well, well I'm... Uh, first of all, we'll try to stop events in the Middle East, so this is topical when you, yes. when you show it. Uh, we, uh, I'm a member of the mission, I'm a minister plenipotentiary on the mission, and my field of activity is Asian affairs, and uh, I'm also, because of my dark past in communications, I'm also supervising uh, public affairs. Yes, because if we could go down through that whole uh, history of uh, activities, he's had a great deal in the broadcasting field. That's right. All right, to the issue as we have it at the present time. Could you briefly tell us your interpretation of the situation between Israel and the Arab world as it is uh, at the present? And as I said, understanding that this may be broadcast after you're actually well, talking. Well, this is easy. I wish, I wish I could hope that the situation will change in, in five days or in 15 days or in mm -hmm. 15 weeks. Unfortunately, we are uh, deadlocked uh, in our uh, relationship with the Arabs now since the uh, June war with not uh, much progress. Uh, we thought that uh, after the war we'll uh, sit down and uh, finally after three wars in one generation we'll uh, be able to achieve a uh, permanent and durable and just peace between us and our Arab neighbors. Unfortunately, it was not given to us and uh, as I say, I don't uh, expect or anticipate that we are going to have a uh, breakthrough in the, in, in the near future. Uh, the um, special representative of the Secretary General of the United Nations, Ambassador Yaring, is now in the Middle East, and uh, the only thing he could agree uh, with the parties uh, was that uh, he'll now go back to Moscow, where he's a Swedish ambassador, and on the middle of January will he probably meet the ministers of Israel Egypt and Jordan for another round of talks. Hopefully then maybe something will uh, get moving. Uh, so far, um, uh, unfortunately, the Arabs have not yet resolved to make peace with Israel. And as long as they don't resolve to make peace, uh, the most we can do is preserve the ceasefire. Do you think the climate is uh, more favorable now for a uh more permanent peace than it was two years ago? Uh, well, uh, we thought the climate for peace is always there. Uh, it's more, a, cli it's more a, uh, a question of, of attitudes of peoples and governments. Now, uh, we thought that uh, there was enough uh, strife and misery and uh, wars in the Middle East, I mean, for more than one generation. Uh, unfortunately, it's... Uh, uh, the, the Arab countries, uh, maybe uh, you see the trouble is that we are almost the only country in the Middle East where the government uh, appoints the chief of staff and not the other way around. Mm -hmm. And uh, unfortunately we haven't seen on the part of the Arab governments this uh, desire for peace and this uh, desire to, uh, for the welfare, this, the, the, this uh, uh, a real effort for the welfare and, and well-being and peaceful living of, of, the, of their people. They have their grandiose plans about conquests and uh, God knows what, and um, we're not getting nearer. Also, there is uh, this, uh, unfortunately, going to the more political side of the problem, uh, they have the backing of a, of a great power, the Soviet Union, which does not seem to be interested in the peace settlement. Uh, they seem to be striving on this uh, situation of no peace and no war. It gives them a more opportunity to penetrate deeper and deeper into the Middle East. Well, uh, as long as this situation persists, uh, there's not much hope. What position uh, would you see uh, the United States playing in making it possible and contributing to a peace effort? 
Well, uh, I must say the, uh, the United States government has contributed to the peace effort all along. It has given full backing to the Yaring mission. Uh, it has uh, backed all initiatives, whether the United Nations or direct, uh, to uh, get uh, the parties to talk peace. It uh, was ready to uh, help in, at many uh, stages with uh, material help, with very uh, uh, wise and imaginative plans of uh, economic development, uh, whether it was the Jordan waters or whether it was uh, um, the atomic uses, uh, the peaceful use of atomic energy for the desalination of water. The United States has, has, has tried very hard over the years, but as I say, uh, they are not, not not alone now in the Middle East. They, uh, the uh, Russians have uh, uh, put in a very powerful fleet in the Mediterranean. They are uh, arming the Arabs to the teeth. They are sending uh, flows of weapons to the to the uh, Arab states, and uh, the competition is not even. Some of uh, the authorities that were participants at the. Uh, uh, conference have expressed uh, well. On one, the uh, the question was asked: What does Russia have at stake, and what does the United States have at stake, and do they both want peace? One of the gentlemen said that they very definitely both wanted uh, peace and were working uh, toward peace, both uh, Russia and the United States, and that neither one had anything to gain by uh, continued conflict. Do you think this is true? Well, no, I wouldn't uh, phrase it that way. I would say this. Uh, the United States definitely desires and is working for peace. I would go <coughs> as far as saying that Russia maybe doesn't want war. Mm -hmm. But I can't say that she wants peace. If she wanted peace, she would have had it by now. I mean, uh, uh, the Arab states, if Russia wanted peace, would have made peace now. In other words, uh, you're saying that both, uh, that Russia does not want all-out war, but that no, she does not want well, completely at peace. I think I think uh, she's taking advantage of this, as I say, of this condition, which is no war and no peace, because this makes the Arab governments more and more dependent on Russia. It gives Russia more and more leverage in the Arab states, and uh, gives them uh, more uh, 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 room for penetration, both in the military sense and in the economic sense. Well, is there uh, anything of that as a nation that we can do to uh, uh, perhaps make it necessary for Russia to want peace? Well, I think uh, mm, I think uh, we had pr ha had pronouncements by uh, by by the uh, president of the United States and by the uh, uh, president elect of the United States uh, definitely that. Uh, uh, the United States has a role to play uh, and will play its role. Do you see a change with uh, President-elect uh, Nixon taking office? Well, uh, I think, uh, fortunately, for, our, for Israel and I think for the free world and for peace in the Middle East, the um, position of the United States government on the Middle East and uh, its friendship to Israel was never a partisan business. It was always bipartisan policy towards Israel and towards the Middle East was bipartisan. So maybe the emphasis will be different. Uh, the, but I guess that in basically in the policy of peace and the policy of support of, in the broadest sense for support for Israel, uh, we hope there will be no difference. One other thing that became apparent uh, throughout the conference, that uh, the feeling that the Arab world had lost much confidence in the United States because of the uh, more assistance being given Israel than uh, the Arab world. Could you comment on this? Well, I, I don't think it, 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 it was correct. Uh, over the years, uh, before the uh, uh, Arab states, I mean, not all of them, but uh, Egypt and Syria, uh, became uh, really client states of Russia, uh, the, the United States was supporting uh, economically, not militarily, but economically. Uh, was uh, supporting the Arab states uh, no less than it was supporting Israel. Uh, and even now, um, I don't think that uh, those Arab countries uh, which preserve their friendship for, uh, for America, like uh, Jordan and Saudi Arabia, 
uh, and Lebanon, let's say. I don't think that they, uh, that this claim is correct, not at all.